Good morning, everybody. Uh, good evening or good afternoon, depending where you are. Thank you for joining us for the international workshop on environment, sustainability, and education. I am Owen Pozimoni Levy from Teachers College, and together with my colleague Daphna Gan from the Kibbutzim College in Israel, we are happy to host this event. Let me tell you a little bit about the workshop, and this time I'm going to use some numbers. So the workshop starts. Uh, in March 2020, a couple of weeks into the pandemic, we realized that with the global pandemic, we won't be able to meet, discuss, exchange ideas. So Daphna and I decided to set up a platform for us, for our students, for our colleagues. And since then, we had three seasons of this workshop, 26 episodes, more than 1,800 people are joining us on our listserv, and the listserv keep growing. We have average attendance of 55 people every session and more than uh, 2,700 views on YouTube. We believe that the impact of this work is beyond the numbers. It's about community, creating a community of scholars that meets on a regular basis to talk about issues that intersect sustainability, environment, and education. We are happy that you are joining us, and we hope that you will share uh, the recording of this um, events and other events with your colleagues so more people can benefit from the discussions that we are having here. For those who need certificate of participation for professional development or other recognitions, uh, please shoot us an email. We are more than happy to provide you with the certificate. Um, we won't be able to produce it to everybody that RSVP because of capacity, but if you reach out to us, we are more than happy to send you a certificate. Please do that after the um, event today. I want to move very quickly for the speakers of today. Uh, the title is Sustainability and the Environment in Early Childhood Education, a Portrait of the Ollingworth Preschool. I'm very happy to have my colleagues from Teachers College, Lisa Wright and Sarah Doerr. Lisa uh, is a colleague of mine, a faculty, a lecturer in the Department of Curriculum and Teaching and celebrating th 35 years at, uh, at the head of the Ollingworth Preschool. Lisa, this is a wonderful way to celebrate your work, and I'm eager to hear what you have to say. And Sarah is now serving as the director of the center. Um, I will post their bios because I really want to give them as much time to share with us the great work of the Ollingworth Preschool at Teachers College. I will tell you that uh, the preschool is located two or three minutes from my office, and every time I'm walking by to the Center for Sustainable Futures office, I'm really enjoying to see the kids doing something, playing, uh, drawing, and the art is usually on the wall, and it's really inspiring to see what you can do with kids so young. So Lisa and Sarah, the floor is yours. Um, I'll stop sharing so you can start sharing your own slides. Thank you, Oren and Daphna, for inviting us. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a topic that we are passionate about. Um, this is not a curriculum. Uh, this is a way of life in Hollingworth Preschool. And uh, Sarah and I both bring <clears throat> a lens to this work and the believe in the um, enormous potential or limitless potential that young children have. And mm -hmm. so this is... Uh, this is where we are beginning. Okay, I'm going to go and uh, go ahead and share my uh, my slides. We'll put we're going to put together a folder with materials in it, and then we'll make that link available to you. I can tell you that's not going to happen today, <laughs> but uh, by tomorrow or the or the next day, and that this the slides will be in will be in that folder. Okay, we good, Sarah? Let me see that. Great. So this is uh, this is us. Uh, this is uh, this is Teachers College, and uh, we sit on the corner of 120th and Broadway, and you can see the uh, the drawing 
note the green color that one of our uh, one of our children one of our children uh, did. So when you come into our classroom or when we come to our work, um, we we really base our work on Maxine Green, uh, Rachel Carson. Uh, absolutely the, the other name is is slipping me but it'll 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 come back to me and so as we go along you're going to see quotes along the bottom uh that give you some uh some some underpinnings of our of our thinking so here we are in in the middle of new york city in an urban uh environment with children who have who are city kids and uh we're going to tell you our story or our, or our portraiture, which is a style of uh, research that uh, Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot developed. Um, she's an emeriti faculty at Harvard School of Education. And the portraiture is just, is, is gathering kind of this thick description and, and providing a case study that really shows exemplary work. So, so often in education, we're, we're, we're told what doesn't work and her stance was, well, let's tell people, let's tell people what uh, what does work. That said, we are a work in progress, and we will be the first to we will be the first to uh, to to say that. Okay. 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 And one of the things that we that we all know is so important is that the most critical years of development are zero to five. And more recently, the research has even narrowed that to zero to three. And when we think about this, children are creating, children this age are creating one million new neural connections per second. We want to be a part of that. We want to be a part of those neural pathways. We want to. We want this to be the time that children are immersed in the what will be the foundation for later uh, for later activism and uh, and important work. We are engaged in important work. That, that being said. So here's some interesting, interesting ideas kind of juxtaposed to that what's happening with brain development. And AUIC, which in the, in the US is our, uh, is our National Association for Early Childhood, and is really one of the, it, it's the, it's the largest one. It has the most power. It sets the policy. It sets all of our developmentally appropriate practices, which is, you know, like a very, very thick book. And just essentially tells early childhood uh, folks what you know what children are capable of, what we should be doing. In this uh, book, which was updated in, in 2022, there is not a mention of early childhood education for sustainability in the environment, nor is it included in the 10 essential standards by the same organization. So we can ask ourselves, why is this area so marginalized that the early childhood organization isn't recognizing it at all? Uh, when, when we know what's happening to the, uh, to the, to the brain. Just a quick sum of a little bit of the literature. Essentially, it, there, there have been two comprehensive uh, reviews of the literature based on certain criteria. And um, the, the first study reviewed about 1,500 empirical studies, and only six, D6, met the criterion for um, environmental education. However, even with that, uh, we should know that environmental education was kind of loosely applied, and a lot of it was uh, nature uh, and 
and nature play, which of course is very, uh, very important, but uh, not, not the whole totality. And then uh, we do have here in the U.S. we have some uh, nature schools, you know, nature schools and farm schools and forest schools, uh, but there there are very there are very very few of uh, of those schools. So in a national study uh, identified two hundred and fifty preschools, uh, forest schools, and 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 nature and nature skills. What's interesting is, is if you look at this literature, if you read these reviews of the literature, the, the reason for exposing children, to have children in nature, to talk about the environment was not to develop a love for this planet we live on. Rather, it is uh, justified because it promotes cognitive and physical development. Right, so we seem to always back into, well, this is good for kids' executive function. This is really good for cognitive flexibility. And as if we, as if we need to justify this. And we can justify it, but we do need to justify it in the ways that are the, 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 the traditional ways that we, that, that we justify um, other areas. Does uh, working in environmental education and sustainability in early childhood, do the children develop cognitively and physically? Of course they do. But we don't, we, I guess, take, um, you know, we have a very different perspective. We're not doing what we do because it develops cognitive skills in kids. We're doing what we do because we think it is our moral imperative to do so. Uh, what is missing is the intersection of the literature between early childhood uh, education, sustainability, environmental education. It's as if they're in two different silos and the crisscross, uh, it, 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 the, the intersection, it, it, it doesn't, it, it is not happening. And so uh, that gives you, uh, I think that that gives you a sense of what's, of what's not available, what's not available when we are teaching uh, students who come through pre-service programs uh, and when we're doing professional learning with more uh, novice teachers. So here's some more information from the US. Uh, children spend 10 minutes a day um, playing outside. And they spend 44 hours per week in front of a uh, in front of a screen. 90% of their outdoor outdoor time is in a formal setting. So it's the playground at school. It may be the it may be the park. New York City, our recess is 20 minutes. Um, our children are spending less time outside than any other uh, than any other generation. And this is. Uh, you know, I don't know that we have researchers going to draw a straight line, but we do. Uh, we do know that uh, you know when we talk to teachers, they will very quickly tell you the kids don't get out enough. They don't have. Um, they don't have enough resource. So what we're doing is this is a call, this is a call to action, and it's based on this notion of the power of early, a reconceptualization for early childhood, and. As we are evolving in this reconceptualization, we are centering sustainability and fire and environmental education as our core, as our core focus. And so some of the uh, some of the areas, and honestly, just a just a, a few, someday I'll come and visit. And we'll talk. We'll talk more. Our door is always open. So one of this, one of the things that's really important is this idea of cultivating wonder, uh, and agency. So wonder is that you know what is this? What am I looking at? Uh, it's not what do I know. It's not what is the name of this leaf. It is I'm looking at this and what am I seeing? Place-based education. What we're talking about is how we are doing this at Hollingworth and in and in our in our neighborhoods. We think that 
much of this could be applicable to other to other schools as well with some uh, culturally responsive uh, um, uh, adjustments. Uh, I'm going to go on because now we're going to share with you exactly what this exactly what this means. So creating a sense of wonder and agency. And I think that this is Sarah's favorite quote uh, from Rachel Carson, who wrote this, uh, who wrote this uh, book, a sense of a sense of wonder, and that'll be on your list. And it was actually published posthumously, and it was a, it was a, it was a book written for parents. Uh, if I had influence with the good fairy who's supposed to preside over all of the christenings of children, I should ask that her gift to each child in the world be a sense of wonder so indestructible that it would last through life. And so children come with wonder. And what we are doing is we are holding space for that wonder to continue to grow and develop. And uh, so that they will, so that they will have that with them. And then the other thing is agency, uh, children's voices. What do they have to say? What uh, what are what are they going to do? How can they be part of this in, uh, important work? And and throughout, you're just going to see some books that we've posted, and which are books that are tied to the topic that we're talking about. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, sense of wonder, sense of agency, falling in love. If you love something, you will care for it. And if you care for it, you will save it. And, you know, that's Jane Goodall's, you know, mantra over and over again. So we, you know, we take the children outside uh, to play, to find a tree. Uh, we look at artifacts that they are that they are bringing in. We want them to love this planet. And there's this wonderful song called "This Pretty Planet Spinning in Space," uh, and and that's one of this that's one of the songs on our on our uh, on our playlist. So wonder, falling in love, um, and I'm gonna uh, turn. To Sarah, yes, to, to pick up here. So, with all of these goals and mindsets that Lisa mentioned, it's so essential for us to have a community that shares this vision. All of the educators at Hollingworth are also TC students, uh, which means that we bring such a willingness to learn, um, to reflect, and to embody the wide awakeness that Maxine Green talked about. Um, there's there's so much momentum when the faculty as a whole knows um, and prioritizes the importance of sustainability in our daily practices. And we sustain this momentum um, with our professional development meetings, our faculty trips to explore our neighborhood, our, our book talks as a faculty, um, our collaborative classroom care, um, our collaborative curriculum planning, I'm in a whole lot of optimism because as adults, we we may carry a lot of anxiety for the state of the earth. And, and I know I certainly do, um, but the work that we do as a teaching team sustains our hope and enables us to design and implement developmentally appropriate mindful and learning experiences for the Hollingworth preschoolers in a way that, you know, highlights that hope and optimism. And then our collaboration also extends to the children's loved ones. So we're constantly partnering with the Hollingworth parent community so that they can take up the goals we have for the children too. So whether we're posting book talks or our monthly curriculum chats or our monthly in-school events where children and loved ones come together to explore an invitation together, our aim is to model you know, small steps, accessible, um, accessible things that families can do to nurture these environmentally conscious habits 
um, for the children. So we are sharing resources, book lists. We're, we're bringing parents to the Columbia Green Market with us. Um, and we're also asking parents to be reflective about their own early experiences, um, either in nature or, or their, you know, what their values for sustainability um, look like as a family so that they can be part of this um, modeling for their children too. Then with our, you know, our teachers set up and our parents um, um, collaborating with us, we know that the environment is reflecting the values we hold too. So if you were to step into one of our preschool spaces, and I would invite anyone who is interested in a visit to let us know, you would see that the classroom environment embodies the values that we hold. So there are opportunities for children to explore, to play, um, and to develop their emerging identities as stewards of the earth. Um, so here, the children are immersed in a butterfly sanctuary. Um, and then taking up you know, real tools to explore the questions that they have and to experience that sense of wonder alongside their friends and teachers at school so that when they you know, leave school at the end of the day, they are constantly looking for those, for those moments to share the joy and wonder um, with their loved ones and siblings. And then with the teachers, and parents and the environment all prepared and set up, we were now able to put these habits into practice and to develop the muscle memory for the children. Um, so in the classroom, we are you know, taking small steps to model these choices that the children can, can take up and make their own. So with our air conditioning, we, we teach the children to dress in layers so that um, we're comfortable and, and using as little energy as possible throughout the day. Um, the lighting in our classroom is also mindful of the energy use that we have in place. Um, we have a beloved um, horticulturalist job in the preschool where the children take turns to care for the plants using leftover water uh, from our reusable water bottles. And so they, they get to see and observe the plants being cared for and when they are you know, cared for and loved, how they thrive in the classroom environment. Um, we're also modeling reusing and recycling, whether we are composting and then bringing that compost to the Columbia Green Market, um, teaching the children to see the potential in um, their lunch and snack containers for you know, whatever their latest invention or um, prototype might be from our maker space. Um, and then we're also having the children be mindful of how they are traveling to and from school and being a participant in the New York City transit system um, and how that, how that impacts really all of us together. And Lisa is gonna talk about how we choose materials that also take up these values. So the, as uh, Sarah is sharing, uh, this work is this work is is part of everything that we do. This is really the the center of of our work. And so, if we did all of those practices with the children, uh, that would be that would certainly be wonderful. But as uh, as educators in the um, in in the center, we and remember this just, this didn't just happen all at once. This is um, we're always engaged in a cycle of inquiry, and so we started to think about the materials that we the materials that we have, and and looking at materials and how many of these materials are sustainably made. And we made a commitment to purchase materials that are uh, sustainable. And so by looking at, sometimes looking at small companies, uh, our criteria is, is it durable? Because we're going to use it for a very, very long time. It's going to be well-loved and well-worn. Um, does it reduce consumption? Um, is it sustainably made of renewable materials? Does it have a small carbon footprint? Uh, is it a small business? 
and can we buy it used? We have found uh, wonderful materials that meet all those criteria on eBay. They're used, which is wonderful. Uh, we don't need we don't need to buy new if somebody's done with it and they're ready to pass it off. So this set right here of the Uncle Goose uh, blocks, which are made sustainably, were purchased from eBay for 99 cents. Um, we also use materials from nature. And the first question is, ask, do we need this? That's always the first question with any of our materials. We have materials from nature that, uh, that we have in our closet that are uh, preserved and you can see some of them, some of them here. If we do need more materials or children become particularly interested in materials, first we might make sure that it's not living, um, that it is a renewable natural resource uh, or that it is collected from some abandoned resources, that it's engaging to the children, that it's durable, that it's taste safe, because after all, they are three, four, and five, that it can be washed or it can be roasted in the, uh, in, in the oven. And then, uh, you know, we're in, we're, we're here on the, you know, Morningside Heights, and we don't have to go too far to find such robust and compelling nature opportunities. So right in our Teachers College courtyard, we have a rain garden. If you look at the picture of the uh, child who's stacking those round uh, pieces, that is our, um, our mud kitchen which also comes with other large materials and that can live outside. It's treated with an all natural uh, finish and it can be refinished uh, over and over and over again. And I think we've probably had ours for about seven years and it's, it's, it's in great shape. Um, children love going to the math lawn. That is where the very, very large tree is. And you just think of the magnitude of that of the children recognizing you know, the height of the tree to uh, to themselves. We go to Riverside Park. Uh, we go to the, the bird sanctuary in Riverside Park, and we go to Sakura Park, which actually has 2,000 cherry blossom trees. So there are times when we go outside, and it's, it merely is to experience nature and to captivate that sense of wonder and for children to set their own adventures and their own explorations. Sometimes we go outside with an intention and something that intention is established by the children, sometimes it may be um, established by the teachers. So we will sometimes go out and we're looking for the signs of the seasons um, changing. Um, we ask children when we go out with an intention, what do you see? What do you notice? And what do you wonder? So what do you see? You're just, you're looking. You're just looking at something. Now, what do you notice? What do you notice about what you see? Just in plain words. And then what do you wonder? What do you wonder about that? You know, what do you, what do you wonder about these, uh, you know, these leaves that are uh, on the ground that are being given a close look through those uh, through those hand lenses. And then we will bring this back into the classroom where children can you know, do, uh, do drawings of what they saw outside. And I must point out the picture that is all the way to my right of the two children who are overlooking uh, uh, a portion of Riverside Park and they have their clipboards and their uh, their writing uh, tool and they're drawing pictures of, of the drawing pictures of what they see. And we know that that's so important because we are documenting what we see. We have the great good fortune of this marvelous greenhouse, which sits atop of uh, one of the buildings at Barnard College. So it's about two blocks uh, away from us. And again, we approach it with, what do you see? What do you notice? What do you wonder? And as, as members of the Hollingworth community, we ask the children, ask questions of whoever's at the greenhouse at the time. And it's usually a, uh, 
usually a Barnard student, and they're wonderful and they're wonderful with the kids and they share the kids, you know, joy and amazement. And I mean, just look at that bounty of nature and how much is how much is there and what children can notice and you know what plants are in water what plants are succulents uh what 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 shapes are they and children have been known to ask questions like what's a greenhouse for and how do you take care of all these plants how does this help conservation yes a child did ask that and um do you want to come to school and see our plants and so there's that marvelous sense of agency again oh, you've got plants here in greenhouse. Well, you should see what we have. Uh, you should see what we have in our preschool. Come come and see. So again, the children are developing this, this agency and this, this invitation. You've, you had us here. Now we, we would like to, in return, have you come and see what, and see what we do. We look at phenology and you know, we're looking at the customary things. We're looking at the, what are those harbingers of the season? So tree leaves and buds and blooms and dropping seeds and gardens. But we really focus this understanding around the Columbia Green Market. Um, and so the Green Market is about six blocks away from us. And the children go every week. And uh what they notice by talking to the farmers is that there are the same produce is not there all the time. So when the children go and notice that there's no more summer squash, which they purchased a couple of weeks forward and may have been on their list of what they wanted to get again, they talk to the farmer about why, why it isn't there. And they learn things like eating what's in season, what, what grows in the summer, what is, you know, what are some of these early, uh, you know, green leaves that come in the, uh, in, in the spring. So this whole notion of going to, you know, getting our green bark, mar getting our, our green market bag and our compost, which if you live in New York City, you know, we all freeze our compost. they come with their questions or they come with their noticings and they feel very, very comfortable uh, speaking to the farmers about why something isn't there or, oh, this is new. Why is this here? Or what is this? Um, they notice if a farmer is not at the green market. So, so some of the dairy, uh, the dairy farmers may not be at, at the green market when it's a really, really hot day. And then of course we come back and we eat what we we bought. The children cook and eat, and we have a, a grand celebration uh, called Thanks Gathering, where the children prepare what they've purchased from the green market, and they invite their parents, and they set the table, and they are so thrilled to be the servers of what they have uh, of what they have purchased. We'll hear children say to their loved one, you know, we went to the green market today. Can we go after school? And that's it. You know, that's like if if that's that's that, you know, the 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 sense of what's establishing in that muscle muscle memory is then transferred to uh to the teachers. We do inter interdisciplinary themes um in our classroom. Uh, and we will always center one of our themes around um, citizen scientist. And so for uh, for quite a few years, um, we will we will follow the monarch butterfly migration, uh, working with Journey North and Monarch Watch. Uh, we noted that uh, the monarch butterflies really need extra care. Um, we don't necessarily talk about endangered uh, because that's that's can be scary for children. We're always looking to to put things in a way that children can see the hope and the activism and that it is developmentally appropriate. So we start with what do you know? 
what do you wonder? And then we end with what you've learned. And so by working with these two organizations, uh, we can, with, um, with Journey North, we can track our sightings as citizen science, citizen scientists. And it's really interesting if you go on there right now, uh, they're, they, the, the monarchs are sort of like on the, uh, on the, on the border of Texas and still largely in, in Mexico. They haven't, haven't started to come, uh, they haven't started to come north yet. It's still a bit too cold. Um, and then with Monarch Watch, we can very gently collect monarchs and we can tag them and then we enter all of our data. Is it male or female? What's the number? And we enter all of that data into the um, into the into the Monarch Watch. And they have a scientist who is uh, available for questions. And so we can we can send a question. And if we're really lucky, our question might be answered. And so the children want to know, well, what can we do? Well. And they said, well, we can plant milkweed in the courtyard containers. And you may think, hmm, you know, maybe that's not the best way, but best place to put uh, milkweed because we're not sure if the monarchs, if that's the route of the monarchs. But still, we'll do it. We'll do it and, we, we, and, and we'll observe what, what happens. Um, we can put a way station in Riverside Park. There's one in Central Park. Why don't we do it in Riverside Park? And then we can tell them. So we tell everyone what we learned. And we can ask them to help. And we can put a table in Zankel Hall, that's our main entrance, and tell everyone. So these children understand the power of knowledge and that if people are going to act, they need, um, they need information. And then they learned that through um, Monarch Watch, we can order a free flat of Monarch, uh, I'm sorry, milkweed, Milk, milkweed plugs. So it's a little bit early, but we will certainly go ahead and do and do that. In our uh, literature becomes a very, the liter literature is a very important part of, of Hollingworth. In instances where we're talking about sustainability and the environment, we really um, amplify um, um, indigenous, uh, indigenous uh Voices, indigenous authors, and so what you're what you're seeing here is just a small, uh, a small collection, and the the book has to be written by an indigenous author as well as um, an indigenous illustrator, and this is Robin Wall Kimmerer who wrote um, Braiding Sweetgrass. It's not just land that is broken, but more importantly, our relationship to the land. And we want the children to have the relationship to the land and the indigenous, the indigenous voices speak with such passion about the land and what, what is gratitude and how do we appreciate everything that uh, Earth or Tur Island has has given us. Then we sing. We sing a lot at Hollywood Preschool and we sing for eco joy. And so songs that are going to instill this, again, this love. I love the mountains, inch by inch, the garden song, what a wonderful world. Um, and then some of our others that are not in picture books, if I had a hammer, you're amazing. Uh, the circle game, we've got the whole world in our in our hands. Um, there are books that we will pull from our uh, our library because they, when we do our audit, they don't, they're, 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 they're not something that we want to keep. So this book, which is, has beautiful illustrations, but the, the title is, This Land is Your Land. And we say, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not, the your land meaning the uh, the people who came over and displaced the indigenous peoples. So as lovely as the song it is, that has been um, that has been recalled. 
uh, that they've removed from our uh, from our library. And then you say, well, what about climate change? Well, climate change. Um, think about how developmental where. Think about the developmentally appropriate appropriateness for young children for three, four, and five year olds. And I just want to walk you through this very small example, and then I want to tell you what we do. So this is a book that we ordered because the title is um, The Lonely Polar Bear, a subtle, um, it's a, a, a subtle intro introduction to climate change. And so Sarah and I thought, okay, well, let's get that. And let's see, because the age range is three to six, let, let's see what this subtle introduction is. We did not read this book to the children. Um, so the lonely talk, it, it just, you know, the polar bear was having great fun uh, meeting all the different, meeting all the different animals. And then as you get towards the end, you can see that time has passed and the polar bear, bear grew older, but he wasn't as big as he should have been. There was little for him to eat on the slowly melting snow. The pieces of ice drifted farther and farther apart. He was without his spirit friend. He felt lost. Let's stop right there and say that we emphatically do not believe that that is developmentally appropriate for the children because there is nothing tangible that they can do. And this is really scary because we're talking about uh, we're, we're talking about the loss of the the Arctic and the loss of polar bears. And you know what? Children ask questions and children bring things that you don't know. And so there's going to be one child who said, oh, I know about that. The, the polar bears are all going to die. That's, that's hopeless, you know, and, and that's really scary for some of the children. It's too big. And then at the very end, it says, somewhere in the snowy North Pole, a polar bear is sitting quietly and peacefully enjoying his beautiful sky filled with the northern lights. And it's like, excuse me? Really? That's, that is, that is, a, you wanted a happy ending? Uh, so that's what you put, that's, that's so disrespectful to children that they would now believe after all of this, and yes, it's fiction, that the, the polar bear is now happy and watching the aurora, um, uh, the aurora borealis. And Maxine Green says, you know, for me, the child is a veritable image of becoming, of possibility, poised to reach towards what is not yet. That's what we want the children to do. We want the children to have this sense of, of um, hope and that they can do something. You know, could they do something? Could they, you know, have a little bake sale and raise some money and send it to some polar bear organization? Sure, they could do that. That's meaningless. That is not what we were talking about. That does not, that does not solve a problem. Um, what do we do? We uh, Lisa, <clears throat> Lisa, sorry, we have uh, about two more minutes because we we want to answer the question yeah. from the, and we also want the, the breakout room, so. Yes, thank you for thank you for giving me the time check. This is my last this is our last slide, and Good. so we so we so we introduce the children to activists to young activists who are doing very very important work, or who uh, maybe are much older now, but we are sharing picture books of what they did when uh, when they were younger. So of course we have Greta Thunberg. Um, Autumn uh, Peltier, and each one of these we read and we talk about and we learn more about them, and then we decide, you know, we we look, we think back to what we are doing as um, as activists. So always the always the hope. Um, okay, uh, Daphna. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Lisa and Sarah, for now. And we want to have maybe one or two questions from the audience. I saw a lot of questions in the chat that, Sarah, you answered some of them, but uh, maybe there are people that want to ask because I think there, there were several questions that uh, we can elaborate a little bit and then we will go to the breakout room. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so... Uh, um, Asancia? Yes, hello. Yes. Hi. Hello, thank you so much for this beautiful presentation. Really, really uh, exciting. Uh, I am curious. Uh, in in one of the slides you slides you showed how you have the green market that you take the kids there. So my question is, have there been questions, issues raised by the children themselves about the different images they get from a supermarket where everything is in you know wrapped in plastic and perfect red tomatoes, no uh, no no dirt so to speak and uh, uh, so because for me this is where I guess the core of the sustainability issues could 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 come up so I'm really curious to know you know if you had any kind of you know questions and what kind of conversations discussions you might have had with children thank you that was for you Sarah <laughs> you know I think the the trips that we take as a community to the green market are so special that the children look forward to this, you know, collective experience. And I think that that love translates to how much love they feel for the produce that they see there. And also the conversations that they have with their farmers and seeing the produce there and also like noticing where the farm is located and um, have they traveled to that place before. So they they almost approach the produce that we get from the green market with um, uh, with respect um, and I think love for what they bring back to the classroom. Um, and then we're also noticing that the children are more willing to, you know, when we bring it back into the classroom, we take turns to wash the vegetables and then we prepare the vegetables, we slice them together. And the time that they spend caring for the produce that they, you know, they personally selected and brought back to the classroom, I think supports their like buy-in for what, what the produce looks like. Um, and they, you know, they have the just right tools for them to be able to wash the vegetables too and, and cut them um, safely and with the teacher's support. Uh, thank you, Janet, you raise your hand. Hi, good morning. How Hi. are you? How good are you guys? Um, I just have one. Um, I really like the job that you are doing in Teachers College, but I was uh, wondering about all these uh, words that the kids are learning. For me, one of the words that I really love more is biodiversity, because I think that word can help us to engage with a lot of things. And when you guys were giving us your presentation, that it's wonderful. I was, um, hmm, how we can engage with this new vocabulary with the kids. And also the other thing that, I mean, coming from this Mexican culture, the day of the dead is very important for us, no? And that's the way that we engage uh, science. We are kids with this topic that I noticed that in America, it's kind of complicated, no? When something is finished. And I'm telling you this because talking about extinctions sometimes can be very scary for all of us. Uh, but there are ways that we can kind of emotionally um, start to cope when we are young. And thank you very much. And I really want to keep learning more from you guys. Thank you. Um, I'm taking notes because, as we say, we are we are definitely a work in progress. And uh, I think that the that the inclusion of the, the vocabulary of biodiversity is is really a wonderful suggestion for us. And uh, talking about extinction, so for example, with the monarch butterflies being uh, just put on the red list in July, uh, there are certainly times, there's, there's always going to be some child sitting there when you're talking with who will bring it up. And so we talk about 
they need more care for care. And then we are sitting there waiting for a child to come back and say, you know, Sarah, they're endangered. And then Sarah can come back and say, can you tell us more? And so a child is sharing their, their knowledge. And uh, so it's not that, I think I said, you know, we don't talk about it. We do talk about it, but we're waiting for it to come from the children. Great, thank you. Uh, Maggie, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you so much. This is really so exciting. Um, I have, have <clears throat> excuse me, a question centering around the educators. And um, I'm, I'm thinking as, as we consider eco-pedagogy and uh, the ways in which uh, educators also sometimes need support since they frequently have grown up in an urban environment thinking of nature as something out there or not accessible because we live in a city um, or they may have fears about nature. Um, and so, you know, the first part of my question is have, are you part of, or is TC now looking at how to help educators become uh, experiencing of eco joy and focusing on relationships and and all of that and the and the second piece of that is that I spend a lot of time supporting educators who are working in um, scenes of climate impacts, natural disasters, or unnatural disasters, and so the little children in in those environments have a very strong and traumatic sense of powerlessness and concern about everything that you're talking about. And so I, I was just wondering whether you have seen um, that the agency building activities that you're, you're using are also cultivating a kind of resilience or emotional collectivism where they're you know, working together on something and that brings them a, a stronger, even stronger sense of agency. And also how you help teachers to, to address the really, you know, by now almost traumatic concern about um, the sixth extinction that teachers might be feeling and that might come through when young people are saying, I'm scared. These are, these are really powerful and important questions and questions that the Hollingworth teachers and I are thinking about um, sure. all the time because mm -hmm. we, you know, like I was saying, we, we do carry a lot of worry and the, it seems that, you know, the more information we, we gather as adults and different you know, developments that we hear, it, it is, it can be really difficult to sustain the momentum we have. Um, I think you know, coming out of the pandemic, a lot of the Hollingworth teachers were noticing that we were we were missing time outside as teachers and as as New Yorkers. And so this year, we've piloted a monthly um, care day for teachers. And so one of our faculty meetings is um, it's it stands for cultivating authentic resilience for educators. And that is a space where teachers are encouraged to go outside, to walk to Riverside Park, to you know maybe to go to the green market for themselves. Um, we have teachers who are really excited about the gardening that's here on campus. Um, and sometimes it can, what that care looks like for teachers is you know just a walk outside or you know taking time for themselves so that when they are with the children in nature, um, they're able to be so present and mindful and peaceful and share that connection. Love that. And, and just to add, because Sarah, I don't know if we said this at the top, but the teachers uh, at Hollingworth are all uh, TC grad students. So they're either master students or doctoral students. And they will, uh, many of them will go out to, uh, on to teach, many of them will go out to, on to work with, uh, go, work with um, novice teachers or 
pre-service teachers. And so it, it really is the each one teach one uh, that if you come and you're immersed in this and maybe it's not something as a teacher that you've given a lot of thought to, um, then you, you are now, you too are being um, enmeshed in this. And uh, the interview, uh, grad students do need to interview for these positions. And, and I will say that that is part of the interview because we are looking for, we're looking not so much for knowledge of what you bring, but we are looking for some um, philosophical alignment and passion for, uh, for the work that we do. Great, so the last question is St Staki, Stasti? How, how do you pronounce Stacey. your name? Yeah, Stacy. Stacey. Stacey. Yeah, thank you so much. This is um, super inspiring um, and, I want to like visit Hollingsworth and just see it in action. So, you know, that would be um, lovely. But here's my question is, um, you know, I'm always thinking about like, who doesn't have such an amazing experience? And I wonder about how your, how many students there are, like how can this model move to the most, uh, the students who have the least access to nature um, and just kind of, you know, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I imagine, you know, you have thoughts about that. We do. Uh, we, there's a school that is on uh, 122nd and Amsterdam. It's, it's the public school that is right in our uh, neighborhood. And uh, interestingly enough, it sits on an outcropping of uh, rocks. And uh, we have had a partnership with the school for 23 years. And so these are children who live in, uh, who live in high poverty. And it's a very, very under-resourced school. So mm -hmm. we are able to work with those children over the years and we will bring some of this work to the, uh, you know, to the to the children, and perhaps, you know, even more importantly, our idea is that we that the teachers co-teach with us, public school teachers co-teach with us. So then they're carrying the uh, the work. They're carrying the work forward. I would say that there's that this is, uh, there's so much to do uh, in mm -hmm. this area. And so while we are reaching out to what we include our graduate students, we include those who are in, uh, in our immediate neighborhood, our parents and so forth and so on. Um, we are, our hope is that as we continue our work and we continue to share our work, that others will become inspired. Maybe you only take one small piece of it. That's great. Yep. And that's what, and that's what, uh, you know, that's what the, that's what the hope is. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. So we we would like to, to do some breakout rooms, even though we don't have a lot of time. And uh, Lisa and Sarah uh, prepare for us um, <clears throat> a very nice questions and some materials. I, I see that uh, some of you ask about uh, um, uh, the resources. And the, so if you, if you can share, Lisa and Sarah, your... Uh, <clears throat> and say some words about your question. And, and so we could have 10 minutes of breakout room or something, oh, great. So can you say some words about uh, the questions and about the, um, the your materials? It would be very nice. Certainly. Uh, Sarah just put a link uh, into the chat, that link, includes a document that has some questions that you may like to consider as you go into your into your break. Uh, so we are really we're really looking forward to some of the conversations that you're having. Um, with our materials, uh, we are going to send you we're going to connect you to a Google folder. And all the materials that we've talked about, we're going to provide links for everything. 
Uh, we're going to provide, um, you know, surveys that have been done. We'll, we're going to pro provide you with um, a lot of materials, materials that uh, can directly be impacted, e used in your classroom, as well as background materials, as well as this uh, slide deck. But I know, um, you know, sourcing the books, where do the books come from? Now, where do those materials come from? Um, if you're a teacher and you're doing this, that's the information that you want. So we will make sure that you get it. Okay, so um, Daphna, I think we're ready to go into breakout rooms. Yeah, make sure can you, click can on you that. just say, say the, the question, just to focus the people on the question you prepare, and then we will move on. Okay. D okay, so the questions that we have prepared, we begin with, with asking you to talk about your first um, experience in nature that was memorable, and then how that then may have engendered other uh other experiences we because we def we very much believe that you always have to start with yourself first and then we ask you to talk about the marginalization uh of sustainability and environmental education from uh from early childhood and uh what leverage do we have for including this. We ask you a question about how do we get teachers? And then we ask you to reflect on our presentation, what surprised you the most, what left you with that aha moment, and what will you take and put into put into practice. So any of those uh any of those questions we invite you to discuss. Great. So we will have uh, like 15 minutes of uh, breakout rooms and then we will come back and uh see what what's happened there and uh, so i will do it randomly uh, to three rooms and uh, let's meet back in about uh, 15 minutes uh, lisa or sarah you have something to say to close up uh, the discussion that you were in uh, we have five more minutes uh, for our session so well, thank you everybody for adding in your your perspectives and your questions and kind of troubling the obstacles that we find, but also ending with, you know, a resolution to, to carry these forward and to know that the small community connections that we make and the relationships that we build and this, you know, this joy that we share with children can, can only further us in, in meeting these goals that we have. Thank you, Sarah. Lisa, do you want to add something? Sure. I think that the um, you know, a lot of our discussion revolved around the uh, the you know why isn't that why isn't this work being centered in early childhood? It's you know thinking about children's development and thinking about how how important this is. And then also looking at uh, other countries, um, Australia, as an example, who do, who are doing <laughs> a lot of this, you know, a lot of this work. And so there, there are examples to look at and to turn to, but I think that the, uh, the, the challenge is for us right now in in the US is that we have um we have so many standards as i'm sure in other countries as well um and we have um preschool standards that are part of the co the common core i was horrified when i saw that I just thought for real, you, you like it was, it was like a, a, a an add on and um, and teachers, administrators, as as one of my colleagues said, they're every everyone is so pressed for time to get everything you know checked off that to do list of what you're mandated to do, and so if we can look at this not as an add on, but interwoven into the what you must do. 
uh, then I think we will get more buy-in from uh, from teachers. But it's still it, but there's but there's just there's still something so absolutely disconcerting that our national organization does not include this. And these are the experts. Um, and there's no funding for this. Uh, there's no professional development for this. Um, or if it is, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's few and far between. Um, I think that, I think people don't see it. You know, I think that, that, that I think that people, I think that many people have a blind spot for this, that there are certain things you learn in a preschool and brain development is so rapid. And so here's what you need. Here's what you need to learn. And this is, this is not one of those topics because they will get to that later because they don't understand the science behind it, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I think that our um, sort of the call to action is, is, is really the, you know, you, you, you start small and you grow and you share, you know, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to include our slide deck uh, in the folder and please use it. Use what makes sense, you know, you know, mix it up, do whatever, because that's, because that, that is, that is so critical to our work. It's, it's not for us to come and present to you and then walk away and say, oh, actually you can't, you know, you can't have a copy. It's to share, it's to, and then in turn, you do that, right? And in turn, you do that. And, uh, you know, it, 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 but I think we're at the grassroots stage. Great. Thank you so much. And I love Maggie, your saying, what if nature set the standards of what we need to know and do? So mm -hmm. I uh, agree to this uh, and mm -hmm. to, to be a little bit uh, hope, hope with hope to end this uh, session. So let's try it. And thank you so much, uh, Lisa and Sarah, for uh, this great, great uh, session. And uh, see you next month. Uh, in March, and uh, we will send you an invitation. Thank you, and uh, goodbye. Bye-bye. Everyone. Thank you, everyone.